I'm speaking as a Christian from the Christian faith, and I know that Christians believe in the deity of Jesus and Jesus as Savior, and I'm just wondering what other faiths believe. Would they say Jesus was a prophet, or he was a nice guy, he was a good man? I'm just curious, from the other faith backgrounds, what do you think, Rabbi Sherry? Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahilladzi arsala rasulahu bilhuda wa dinil haqqa. Yuzhinuhu ala dini kulihi wa kafa billahi syahida Ashadu an la ilahi lallahu wa ahdahu la syarika lah Wa ashadu anna muhammad dan abduhu wa rasuluhu la nabiya ba'da Berjumpa lagi dengan channel saya Mars Techno Saya doakan semoga semua sahabat dalam keadaan sehat selalu Pada video kali ini kami akan menampilkan usaha dakwah dari seorang dokter Sabil Ahmad Beliau pada sesi ini menjawab sebuah pertanyaan dari seorang wanita Kristen. Nah sahabat, bagaimana jawaban dari Dr. Sabil Ahmad? Kita saksikan saja video berikut ini. Are climate change is caused by human interactions or is God sending us a message? You know, often when I travel on Highway 294, there is a big sign, it's a big billboard up there that says, We waste in the USA 45% of the food that we purchase from the stores. 45% we waste it. It just goes to garbage. You know, when we look into our refrigerators, right? Many of uh, the homes, they have more than one refrigerator, more than one freezer, and much of the food ultimately just goes to waste. So what does Islam say about climate change, about wastefulness? Three important things. First and foremost, God has given humans the responsibility to take care of the environment, to take care of the whole universe. So we are the caretakers. So we are kind of the gardeners of the whole universe. So first and foremost, we need to realize that responsibility. Second important thing is, we need to make sure that we don't waste the resources. You know, there's a wonderful saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So he mentioned that uh, even when we have to do the ablution, you know, ablution is something that we wash ourselves before we pray. So he said that even if a Muslim is next to a river, lots of water, flowing water in there, even in that river, try, try to conserve the water when you do the ablution. So even if you have abundant resources, we are supposed to conserve the resources. That's the point. <laughs> And number three really important is the better distribution of the resources. That means there are so many people who are less fortunate than us. Many countries around the world, so much poverty around us. If we do better uh, conservation and better distribution of the resources, many of the problems that we see, the climate change, the poverty, the wastefulness, inshallah, God willing, it will go away. So that's Islamic solution to the climate change. Thank you. I would like to now open it up for questions. Anybody in the audience, if you have a question, you'd like to direct that question to just one person or to the whole panel, that would be fine. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Kathy, right there. Yeah, and I know, and I'm coming from a Christian perspective, but we as Christians, we believe in the deity of Jesus, and I'm just wondering from other faiths, how do other faiths view Jesus? Is like a prophet or a good man who came to earth and did good things? I'm just curious what the other faiths would say. I can give you Judaism. Um, I, I, well, if you could ask that again, I'm sorry. Okay, well, or you can mention the question. I'm speaking as a Christian from the Christian faith, and I know that Christians believe in the deity of Jesus and Jesus as Savior, and I'm just wondering what other faiths believe. Would they say Jesus was a prophet, or he was a nice guy, he was a good man? I'm just curious, from the other faith backgrounds, what do you think, Rabbi Sherry, and all of you? <laughs> um, Jesus was a rabbi. Ah! Uh -uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of ours people. Anyways. <laughs> and uh, Jesus is actually mentioned in the Talmud, which is the Jewish law book, which explains everything that takes place in the Torah. So we do acknowledge that there was a person, that he was a great teacher, and they don't really mention his name so much, but Everyone knows who they're referring to when they talk about that specific rabbi <laughs> from Galilee. 
I will give you a simple formula about what Islam says about Jesus. What comes to mind when I think of Jesus is the word Jesus. So every letter of the word Jesus becomes one point about what we believe about Jesus. For example, we say that Jesus was just a messenger, a prophet. The Quran says about it, chapter uh, 5 verse number 75 and many passages. So Jesus was just a prophet according to Islam, right? So J, the E stands for he was empowered by God to do the miracles. So we say the miracles were coming from the creator and Jesus was an agent, just like all the prophets, Abraham, Moses, Solomon, David, all the prophets before him, they were the agents, the prophets of God and through them God was doing the miracles. The S stands for his sole mission of Jesus according to Islam is to invite humanity to the worship of one God. Not to worship him or idols or humans or the creation but to only worship the creator. So J-E-S-U, the U stands for uh, he was uplifted by God before he was crucified. So we don't believe in the crucifixion, we say salvation is by personal responsibility, personal accountability. You have the right belief, you do good deeds, God's mercy comes into play. And the last S of J-E-S-U-S -S stands for the second coming of Jesus. So there is one passage of the Quran, chapter 112. That say he's only he's Allah one and only. He is eternal, he's needed by all. He begets not, nor his begotten, and there is none like unto God. So we don't believe in the sonship of Jesus or the divinity of Jesus. We say there is only one creator, and Jesus was his prophet. So that's what Islam says about Jesus. Thank you. In the present just on the news tonight, they were talking about um, the number of anti-Semitic and racial um, problems that are in our country. So we are talking about peace, and yet we don't seem to spread that message very well. So what would you suggest that different faith communities do to bring about greater peace. So the question was about anti-Semitism and about you know other isms but especially about anti-Semitism and how we can solve it. So I would say that anti-Semitism is a big problem, Islamophobia is a big problem, you know racism is a big problem and all of those isms. So a one sentence answer would be, if we do justice to humanity, to the people, the outcome would be peace. So I can give you one simple example from the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. When he moved from Makkah to Medina in the year 622, there were many Jewish tribes in Medina. So one of the very first thing that he did is to, fi uh, is to uh, make a constitution and that constitution said, that the Jewish people would be one with the Muslims and you may know this from history. So he gave them the rights, the autonomy, the freedom and the protection because in the 7th century at the advent of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, the Jewish people they were, uh, they were at the brink of extinction. So Muhammad peace be upon him with the guidance of the Quran, he gave them autonomy and protection and the freedoms, right? Number one. Number two, when the Spanish Inquisition was going on, it were the Muslims that opened the door and welcomed the Jewish cousins to our lands, the North Africa, the Ottomans, and also Palestine, by the way, important. When World War II was going on, many other countries they were handing over the Jewish people to the Nazis, but all the Muslim countries, they made a pact. So Turkish people, the Turkish Muslims, they gave documents to the Jewish people, 75,000 of them, saying that these are our Turkish citizens, we are not going to hand over a single one of the Jews to you, to the Nazis. So Turkey saved and protected the lives of 75,000 Jewish people. Iran protected 2,000 people. Albania and Kosovo and many, many Muslim countries, close to 100,000 Jewish people. So it is part of Islam to protect our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, and the minorities because every life is special, every life is precious and every life we have to honor. So when we do that 
And when we do fight for justice, the outcome would be peace. That's when Islamophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, inshallah with God guidance, they will go away. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you very much. Selesai. Terima kasih telah menyaksikan video sampai akhir. Semoga bermanfaat. Mohon maaf jika ada terjemahan yang kurang tepat. Dukung channel ini dengan cara like, subscribe, dan share. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Masya Allah, sebuah penjelasan yang sangat ringkas tetapi penuh dengan dalil. Mematahkan argumentasi dari orang Kristen ini. Ternyata poligami adalah sudah ada sejak zaman dahulu. Bahkan di Bible sendiri pun di perjanjian lama disebutkan bahwasanya Nabi Sulaiman beristri lebih dari 700 orang. Pada awal mulanya dokter Sabil Ahmad ini menjelaskan kronologis adanya poligami yang maksimal 4 di dalam Al-Quran. Di Jazirah Arab sendiri sebelum kedatangan Islam di abad ke-7 masyarakat sana sangat tidak menghormati wanita bahkan mereka dianggap sebagai properti dan tidak mempunyai hak diceritakan bahwasanya apabila seorang pria menemukan istrinya melahirkan seorang anak wanita maka dengan tidak segan-segan mereka segera menguburnya bayi wanita tersebut hidup-hidup namun dengan kedatangan Nabi Muhammad yang membawa kitab suci Al-Quran sedikit demi sedikit merubah mereka untuk berahlak lebih baik dan juga menerapkan syariat Islam terutamanya dalam poligami jadi di dalam Islam diatur nikahilah dua, tiga, atau empat tetapi apabila engkau tidak bisa berlaku adil maka nikahilah cukup satu istri saja jadi di sini ada kebijaksanaan Tuhan Allah kepada umat Islam. Jika dibandingkan dengan kitab-kitab ada yang di seluruh dunia, menurut Dr. Sabil Ahmad, beliau belum pernah menemukan pembatasan dalam jumlah istri yang bisa dipoligami, baik itu di Bibel maupun di kitab agama-agama lain. Tapi agama Islam dengan jelas membatasi dan mengaturnya di mana dia harus bersikap adil dan juga bertanggung jawab 100%. Di sesi ini juga Dr. Sabil Ahmad membandingkan dengan kondisi Amerika saat ini. Menurut survei yang dilakukan oleh Tribun Cicego mengatakan bahwa 40% pria Amerika mempunyai hubungan dengan tujuh orang wanita sebelum menikah ataupun tidak ada berhubungan keluarga. Sehingga apabila wanitanya hamil dengan seenaknya saja laki-laki tersebut berpaling kepadanya. Dan yang bertanggung jawab adalah wanita tersebut dan menjadi orang tua tunggal. Menjadi orang tua tunggal tentunya merupakan beban yang sangat berat bagi seorang wanita. Apalagi kecenderungannya adalah mereka tidak mendapatkan kasih sayang dari seorang ayah dan menurut dokter Sabil Kecenderungan mereka adalah bergaul dengan orang yang bersenjata, gangster, dan ada kemungkinan IQ-nya rendah. Jadi bagaimana solusinya? Diberikan pertanyaan lagi kepada para hadirin, yaitu Islamlah solusinya bagi masalah ini. Karena Islam adalah tuntunan dari Tuhan Allah yang tentunya lebih faham atas urusan manusia dan dengan kebijaksanaannya memberikan kesempatan dan sekaligus tanggung jawab yang penuh bagi laki-laki yang ingin berpoligami. Nah sahabat mungkin itu saja sedikit video reaksi dari saya mudah-mudahan bermanfaat. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.